Hello everyone and welcome to Word of Mouth. For those of you who do not know, Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Julie Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. My name is Andrew and today I'll be reading two stories for you. Witch's Loaves by O. Henry and His Smile by Susan Glasbow. If you enjoyed today's readings and would like to watch the next program, Word of Mouth is broadcast on the first and third Thursdays of every month at 12.10 p.m. Central Time. You can watch live through the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library Facebook page, which is at MCCPL Morgan, or you can watch it later on the Montgomery City County Public Library's YouTube page. That's all the announcements I have, so now let's get to the stories. Witches' Loaves by O. Henry. Miss <clears throat> Martha Mitchum kept the little bakery on the corner, the one where you go up three steps and the bell tinkles when you open the door. Miss Martha was 40. Her bank book showed a credit of $2,000 and she possessed two false teeth and a sympathetic heart. Many people have married whose chances to do so were much inferior to Miss Martha's. Two or three times a week, a customer came in in whom she began to take an interest. He was a middle-aged man wearing spectacles and a brown beard trimmed to a careful point. He spoke English with a strong German accent. His clothes were worn and darned in places and wrinkled and baggy in others. But he looked neat and he had very good manners. He always bought two loaves of stale bread. Fresh bread was five cents a loaf. Stale ones were two for five. Never did he call for anything but stale bread. Once Miss Martha saw a red and brown stain on his fingers. She was sure then that he was an artist and very poor. No doubt he lived in a garret where he painted pictures and ate stale bread and thought of the good things to eat in Miss Martha's bakery. Often when Miss Martha sat down for her chops and light rolls of jam and tea, she would sigh and wish that the gentlemanly artist might share her tasty meal instead of eating his dry crust in a drafty attic. Miss Martha's heart, as you've been told, was a sympathetic one. In order to test her theory as to his occupation, she brought from her room one day a painting which she had bought at a sale and set it against the shelves behind the bread counter. It was a Venetian scene. A splendid marble piazza, so it said in the picture, stood in the foreground, or rather, for water. For the rest, there were gondolas with the lady trailing her hand in the water, clouds, sky, and chiaro securo in plenty. No artist could fail to notice it. Two days afterward, the customer came in. Two loaves of stale bread, if you please. You have here a fine picture, madame, he said, while she was wrapping up the bread. Yes, says Miss Martha, reveling in her own cunning. I do so admire art and... No, it would not do to say artist so early. And paintings, she substituted. You think it's a good picture? Uh, the ballots, said the customer. He's not in good drawing. Their perspective of it is not true. Good morning, madame. He took his bread, bowed, and hurried out. Yes, he must be an artist. Miss Martha took the picture back to her room. How gentle and kindly his eyes shone behind his spectacles. What a broad brow he had and to be able to judge perspective at a glance, and to live on stale bread. But genius often has to struggle before it is recognized. What a thing it would be for art and perspective if genius were backed by $2,000 in bank, a bakery, and a sympathetic heart. But these were daydreams, Miss Martha. Often now when he came, he would chat for a while across the showcase. He seemed to crave Miss Martha's cheerful words. He kept on buying stale bread, never a cake, never a pie, never one of her delicious Sally Lunds. She thought he began to look thinner and discouraged. Her heart ached to add something good to eat to his meager purchase, but her courage failed at the act. She did not dare affront him. She knew the pride of artists. Miss Martha took to wearing her blue dotted silk waist behind the counter. In the back room, she cooked a mysterious compound of quince seeds and borax. Ever so many people use it for the complexion. One day, the customer came in as usual, laid his nickel on the showcase, and called for his stale loaves. While Miss Martha was reaching for them, there was a great tooting and clanging, 
and a fire engine came rumbling past. The customer hurried to the door to look, as anyone will. Suddenly inspired, Miss Martha seized the opportunity. On the bottom shelves behind the counter was a pound of fresh butter that the dairyman had left ten minutes before. With a bread knife, Miss Martha made a deep slash in each of the stale loaves, inserted a generous quantity of butter, and pressed the loaves tight again. When the customer turned once more, she was tying the paper around them. When he had gone after an unusually pleasant little chat, Miss Martha smiled to herself, but not without a slight fluttering of her heart. Had she been too bold? Would he take offense? But surely not. There was no language of edibles. Butter was no emblem of unmaidenly forwardness. For a long time that day, her mind had dwelt on the subject. She imagined the scene when he should discover her little deception. He would lay down his brushes and palette. There would stand his easel with the picture he was painting in which the perspective was beyond criticism. He would prepare for his luncheon of dry bread and water. He would slice into the loaf. Ah. Miss Martha blushed. Would he think of the hand that placed it there as he ate? Would he? The front doorbell jangled viciously. Somebody was coming in, making a great deal of noise. Miss Martha hurried to the front. Two men were there. One was a young man smoking a pipe, a man she had never seen before. The other was her artist. His face was very red. His hat was on the back of his head. His hair was wildly rumpled. He clenched his two fists and shook them ferociously at Miss Martha. At Miss Martha? Dummkampf, he shouted with extreme loudness, and then Tossendampfer, or something like that in German. The young man tried to draw him away. I will not go, he said angrily, else I shall told her. He made a bass drum of Miss Martha's counter. You have spoiled me, he cried, his blue eyes blazing behind his spectacles. I will tell you, you, you was von meddling some old cat. Miss Martha leaned weakly against the shelves and laid one hand on her blue dotted silk waist. The young man took the other by the collar. Come on, he said. You've said enough. He dragged the angry one out of the door to the sidewalk and then came back in. I guess you ought to be told, ma'am, he said. What the rose about? Uh, that's Bloomberger. He's an architectural draftsman. I work in the same office with him. He's been working hard for three months trying to plan for a new city hall. It was a prize competition. He finished inking the lines yesterday. You know, a uh, draftsman always makes his pencil uh, drawing first. When it's done, he rubs out those pencil lines with handfuls of stale breadcrumbs. That's better than India rubber. Uh, Bloomberger's uh, been buying the bread here, and, uh, well, today, uh, well, you know, ma'am, that uh, butter isn't, uh, well, Bloomberger's plan isn't good for anything now except to cut into railroad sandwiches. Miss Martha went into the back room. She took off the blue dotted silk waist and put on the old brown serge she used to wear. Then she poured the quinceed and borax mixture out of the window into the ash can. His Smile by Susan Glasbow. Laura stood across the street, waiting for the people to come out from the picture show. She couldn't have said just why she was waiting, unless it was that she was waiting because she could not go away. She was not wearing her black. She had a reason for not wearing it when she came on these trips, and the simple lines of her dark blue suit and the smart little hat Howie had always liked on her somehow suggested young and happy things. Two soldiers came by. One of them said, Hello there, kiddo. And the other, noting the anxiety with which she waited, assured her, You should worry. She looked at them, and when he saw her face, the one who had said, You should worry, said in a sheepish fashion, Well, I should worry, as if to get out of the apology he didn't know how to make. She was glad they had gone by. It hurt so to be near the soldiers. The man behind her kept saying, Popcorn, popcorn, right here. It seemed she must buy popcorn if she stood there. She bought some. She tried to do the thing that was expected of her, so she would not be noticed. 
Then the people came pushing out from the theater. They did it just as they did it in the other towns. A new town was only the same town in a different place. And all of it was a world she was as out of as if it were passing before her in a picture. All of it, except that one thing that she had left. She had come so far to have it tonight, she wouldn't be cheated. She crossed the street, and as the last people were coming out of the theater, she went in. A man yawning was doing something to a light. He must belong to the place. His back was to her, and she stood there, trying to get brave enough to speak. It had never been easy for her to open conversations with strangers. For so many years, it was Howie who had seemed to connect her with the world. And suddenly, she thought of how sorry Howie would be to see her waiting around in this dismal place, after everyone else had gone, trying to speak to a strange man about a thing that man wouldn't understand at all. How well Howie would understand it. He would say, Go on home, Laura. Don't do this, sweetheart. Almost as if he had said it, she turned away. But she turned back. This was her wedding anniversary. She went up to the man. You didn't give all the picture tonight, did you? Her voice was sharp. It mustn't tremble. He looked round at her in astonishment. He kept looking her up and down as if to make her out. Her trembling hands clutched the bag of popcorn and some of it spilled. She let it all fall and put her hand to her mouth. A man came down from upstairs. Lady here says you didn't give the whole show tonight, said the first man. The young man on the stairs paused in astonishment. He, too, looked Laura up and down. She took a step backwards. What was left out wasn't of any importance, lady, said the man, looking at her not unkindly, but puzzled. I think it was, she contended in a high, sharp voice. They both stared at her. As she realized that this could happen, saw how slight was her hold on the one thing she had, she went on, desperately. You haven't any right to do this. It's, it's cheating. They looked at them, not at her, but at each other, as the same counsel together in the presence of what is outside their world. Oh, she knew that look. She had seen her brother and his wife doing it when first she knew about howling. Now, I'll tell you, lady, said the man to whom she had first spoken, in the voice that deals with what has to be dealt with carefully. You just let me give you your money back, then you won't have the feeling that you've been cheated. He put his hand in his pocket. I don't want my money back, cried Laura. I want to see what you left out. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, proposed the young man, taking his cue from the older one. I'll tell you exactly what happened in the part that was left out. I know exactly what happened, cut in Laura. I, I want to see what happened. It was a cry from so deep that they didn't know what to do. Won't you do it for me? She begged of the young man, going up to him. What you left out? Won't you show it for me? Now? He just stood there, staring at her. It means it... But how could she tell them what it meant? She looked from one to the other, as if to see what chance there was of their doing it, without knowing what it meant. When she couldn't keep sobs back, she turned away. Even in her room at the hotel, she had to keep from crying. She could hear the man moving around in the next room, so he, of course, could hear her too. It was all as if it was in the pictures. People crowded together, and all of it that something that seemed like life, and really wasn't. Even that, the one thing, the one moment, really wasn't life. But it was all she had. If she let herself think of how little that all was, it was an emptiness that she was afraid of. The people who had tried to comfort her used to talk of how much she had had. She would wonder sometimes why they were talking on her side instead of their own. For if you have had much, does that make it easy to get along with nothing? Why couldn't they see it? That because of what Howie had been to her and for ten years, she just didn't know any way of going on living without Howie. Tonight made fresh all her wedding anniversaries brought happiness to life again. It almost took her in. And because she had been so near the dear, warm things in which she had lived, when morning came, she couldn't get on that train that would take her back to the house, 
to which Howie would never come again. Once more, it all seemed slipping from her. There must be something. As a frightened child runs for home, she turned to that place where, for at least a moment, it was as if Howie was there. She went to the telegraph office and wired the company that sent out the Cross of Diamonds, asking where the film could be seen. She had learned that this was the way to do it. She had known nothing about such things at first. It had been hard to find out the way of doing. It was a world she didn't know the ways of. When she got the answer, she found the place where the Cross of Diamonds would be shown was more than a hundred miles away, and it meant going that much further away from home. She told herself this was a thing she couldn't do. She told herself this must stop, that her brother was right in the things he had said against it. It wouldn't do. He hadn't said it was crazy, but that was what he meant, or feared. She had told him she would try to stop. Now was the time to do it, now when she would have to go so much further away. But it was going further away. This glimpse of Howie, all that was left of Howie, was moving away from her. And after the disappointment of the night before, she must see him once more, then then yes, then she would stop. She was excited when she had decided to do this. It lifted her out of the nothingness. From this meager thing, her great need could in a way create the feeling that she was going to meet Howie. Once more, she would see him do that which was so like him as to bring him back to life. Why should she turn away from it? What were all the other things compared with this thing? This was one little flash of life in a world that ceased to be alive. So again that night, in the clothes he had most liked, she went for that poor little meeting with her husband, so pitifully little, and yet so tremendous because it was all she would ever have. Again she sat in a big noisy place with so many jostling, laughing people, and waited to see Howie. She forgot that the place had ugly red walls and sickly green lights, and she could somehow separate herself from harsh voices and smells, for she was here to meet Howie. She knew just the part of the house to sit in. Once, she had sat where she couldn't see him as he passed from sight. After that, she had always come very early, so she had to sit there while other people were coming in. But she didn't mind that. It was like sitting in a crowded railway station when the person you love is coming soon. But suddenly, something reached over that gulf between other people and her. A word. A terrible word. Behind her, Someone said, munitions. She put her hand to her eyes and pressed tight. Not to see, that was why she had to keep coming for this look at Howie. She had to see him, that she might shut out that. The picture of Howie, blown to pieces. She hated people. They were always doing something like this to her. She hated all these people in the theater. It seemed they were all somehow against her. And... And how he had been so good to them. He was so good to people like the people in this theater. It was because he was so good and kind to them that he was that he was not Howie now. He was always thinking of people's comfort, the comfort of people who had to work hard. From the time he went into his father's factory, he had always been thinking up ways of making people more comfortable in their work. To see girls working in uncomfortable chairs or standing hour after hour at tables too low or too high for them. He couldn't pass those things by as others passed them by. He had a certain inventive faculty, and his kindness has always made use of that. His father used to tell them that he would break them all up in business if his mind went to working in that direction. He would tell them if he was going to be an inventor, he had better think of something that would make money. How he would laugh and reply that he'd make it all up someday. And at last, one of those things he had thought out to make it better for people was really going to make it better for Howie. It was a certain kind of shade for the eyes. It had been a relief to the girls in their little factory, and it was being tried out elsewhere. It was even being used a little in one of the big munitions plants. Howie was there, seeing about it, and while he was there, he went in there, Howie, there wasn't anything, anything to carry out. The picture had begun. 
she had to wait until almost half of it had passed before her moment came. The story was a tawdry, meaningless thing about the adventures of two men who had stolen a diamond cross, a strange world into which to come to find Howie. Chance had caught him into it. He was one of the people passing along the street which was being taken for the picture. His moment was prolonged by his stopping to do the kind of thing Howie would do, and now it was as if that one moment was the only thing saved out of Howie's life. They who made the picture had apparently seen that the moment was worth keeping. They left it as a part of the stream of life that was going by, while the detective of their story waited for the men for whom he had laid a trap. The story itself had little relation to real things, yet chance made that this vehicle were keeping something of the reality that had been howling, a disclosing moment captured unawares. She was thinking of the strangeness of all this when again the people seated back of her said a thing that came right to her. They were saying scrap heap. She knew, before she knew why, that this had something to do with her. Then she found that they were talking about this film. It was ready for the scrap heap. It was on its last legs. They laughed and said perhaps they were seeing its last appearance. She tried to understand what it meant. Then even this would cease to be in the world. She had known that she ought to stop following the picture around. She had even told herself that this would be the last time she would come to see it. But to feel it wouldn't go any longer, that even this glimpse of how he would go out as, as life goes out? Scrap heap. She sat up straight and cleared her throat. She would have to leave. She must get air, but she looked to see where they were. Not far now. She might miss Howie. With both hands, she took hold of the sides of the seat. She was not going to fall forward, not suffocating, not until after she had seen him. Now. The detective has left the hotel. He's walking along the street. He comes to the cigar store door, and there steps in to watch. And there comes the dog. It was not going to be cut out tonight. Along comes a little dog, pawing at his muzzle. He stops in distress in front of the cigar store. People pass and pay no attention to the dog there on the sidewalk. And then, in the darkened theater, her hands go out. And for the door has opened, and she sees her husband. Howie, there, moving as he always moved. She fights back the tears that would blur him that dear, familiar way he moved. It's almost as if she could step up and meet him, and they could walk away together. He starts to go the other way. Then he sees the dog. He goes up to him. He's speaking to him, wanting to know what is the matter. She can fairly hear the warmth and kindness of his voice as he speaks to the little dog. He fills up the muzzle and binds it too tight. He lets it out a notch. Dear Howie, of course he would do that. No one else had cared, but he would care. Then he speaks to the dog, pets him, tells him he is all right now. Then how he turns away. But the dog thinks he will go with this nice person. How he laughs and tells him he can't come. A little girl has come across the street. How he tells her to keep the dogs from following him. Then again he turns to go, but just before he passes from sight, the child calls something to him and he looks back over his shoulder and smiles. She sees again the smile that had been the heart of her life, and then he passes from sight. And he always leaves people behind him, just as he always left friends behind. There will be little murmurs of approval. Sometimes there's an applause. Tonight, the woman near Laura says, Say, I bet that's an awful nice fella. She never left her seat at once as if moving would break the spell. For a little while after she had seen him, his smile would stay with her. Then it would fade, as things fade in the motion pictures. Somehow she didn't really have it. That was why she had to keep coming, constantly reaching out for something that was not hers to keep. When her moment had gone, she rose and walked down the aisle. It was very hard to go away tonight. There had been all that time the fear that what happened the night before would happen again, that she would not see Howie after all. That had made her so tense that she was exhausted now. And then munitions and scrap heap. Perhaps it was because of all this that tonight her moment had been so brief. 
only for an instant, how we smile had brought her into life. It was gone now. It had passed. She was so warm that when at the door her brother Tom stepped up to her, she was not much surprised or even angry. Tom had no business to be following her about. She had told him that she would have to manage it her own way, that he would have to let her alone. Now, here he was again, to trouble her, to talk to her about being brave and sane, when he didn't know, when he didn't have any idea what he was talking about. But it didn't matter, not tonight. Let him do things, get the tickets, and all that. Even let him talk to her. That didn't matter either. But he talked very little. He seemed to think that there was something wrong with her. He looked at her and said, Oh, Laura, reproachfully, but distressed. I thought you weren't going to do this anymore, Laura, he said gently, after they had walked a little way. How did you know I was here? She asked listlessly. They sent me word you had left home. I traced you. I don't see why you should trace me, she said, but not as if it mattered. Oh, Laura, he said again, well, I must say, I don't think Mrs. Edmonds was much of a friend. It was Mrs. Edmonds who had told Laura that there was this glimpse of her husband in the Cross of Diamonds. She had hesitated about telling her, but had finally said it was so characteristic and beautiful a moment, she felt Laura should see it. From the first, Tom had opposed her seeing it, saying it would be nothing but torture to her. Torture it was, but it was as if that torture were all that was left to life. Tonight, everything was as a world of shadows. She knew that her brother was ta taking her to his home instead of back to her own. He had wanted to do this before, but she had refused. There was nothing in her now that could refuse. She went with him as if she were merely moving in a picture and no power of her own to get out of it. And that was the way it was for the next few weeks. Tom and his wife would talk to her about trying to interest herself in life. She made no resistance. She had no argument against it. But she had no power to do it. They didn't know. They didn't know how it had been with her and Howie. She herself had never been outgoing. It was perhaps a habit of reserve built out of timidity. But she had been a girl whose life did not have real contact with other lives. Perhaps there were many people like that, perhaps not. She did not know. She only knew that before Howie came, the life in her was more of a thing unto itself than a part of the life of the world. Then Howie came, Howie who could get on with anyone, who found something to like in everyone, and in the warmth and strength of this feeling for people, he drew her into that main body of life where she had not been before. It had been like coming into the sunshine. Now he was gone, and they asked her to be alone when she had been through him. It was like telling one to go into the sunshine when the sun was not shining. And the more those others tried to reach her, the more alone she felt, for it only made her know they could not reach her. When you have lived in the sunshine, days of cold mist may become more than you can bear. After a long struggle not to do so, she again went to the long-distance telephone to find out where that picture was being shown. That picture into which was caught one moment of Howie's life as he moved through the world. Worn by the struggle not to do as she was doing, and tormented by the fear that she had waited too long, that this one thing which was left to her might no longer be, she had to put every bit of her strength into establishing this connection with the people who could tell her what she must know. Establishing the connection with the living was like this. She was far off and connected only by a tenuous thing which might at any moment go into confusion and stop. At the other end, someone was making fun of her. They doubted if the cross of diamonds could be seen anywhere at all. The cross of diamonds had been double-crossed. Wasn't it too much of a cross, anyway, to see the cross of diamonds? Finally, another man came to the phone. The cross of diamonds could be seen at a certain town in Indiana. But she'd better hurry, and she'd better look her last look. Why did you want to see it, might he ask. But Laura hung up the receiver. She must hurry. All the rest of it was a blur and a hurry. 
through the unreal confusion drove the one idea. She must get there in time. And that the whole world seemed pitted against her. It was as if the whole of that main body of life was thrown in between her and Howie. The train was late. It was almost an hour for pictures be to begin when she got down at that lonely faraway station. And the town, it seemed, was a mile from the station. There was a bus she must take. Every nerve of her being hurried the bus on until that very anxiety made it seem as if it was Howie himself she would see if only she could get there in time. And being late, the downstairs of the theater was full. Balcony only, said a man as she came in. Oh, won't you find me a good seat? Laura besought him. Like to know I'll find you a seat when there ain't no seat, was the answer. The whole big life of the world was between her and Howie. Upstairs, too, it was hard to find a place. And all those people seated there, for them, it was only a few hours of silly entertainment. But, after a moment, a man directed her to a seat. There was another place beside it, and just as Laura was being seated, a woman came along with two children. We can't all sit together, she was saying, so you just sit here, Mamie. You just sit right in there beside the nice lady. The mother looked at Laura as if expecting her to welcome her child. Laura did nothing. She must be alone. She was there to be with Howie. She was not as late as she had feared. There would be time for getting ready. Getting ready for Howie. She knew that this would be the last time she would see Howie as he had moved through the world. But the last time she would see his face light to a smile. If she did not reach him tonight, she would never reach him. She had a feeling that she could reach him if only something in her... If, if only something in her... She could not finish that. It brought her to a place into which she could not reach. But as never before, she had a feeling that he could be reached. And so, when the little girl beside her twisted in her seat, and she knew that the child was looking up at her, she tried not to know this little girl was there. Tried not to know that any of those people were there. If only she could get them all out of the way, she could reach into the shadows and feel how he near. But there was one thing she kept knowing try her best not to know it. The little girl beside her, too young to be there, was going to sleep. When it came right up to the moment for her to see Howie, she was knowing that that little girl had fallen asleep in an uncomfortable position. Her head had been resting on the side of the seat, the side next to Laura, and as she fell asleep, it slipped from its support in a way that... Could she help it if this child was not comfortable? Angry? She tried to brush this from her consciousness, as we brush dust from our eyes. This was her moment with Howie, her chance. But when her moment came, a cruel thing happened. Something was wrong with the machine that the picture was showing. At just that moment, of all the moments, the worn-out film seemed to be going to pieces before her eyes. After the little dog came along, and just as Howie should come out from the cigar store, there was a flash, a blur, a jumble of movements. It was like an earthquake. It looked like life ceasing to be life. No, she gasped under her breath. No! The people around her were saying things of a different sort. Cut it! What are you giving us? Whoa, boy! They laughed. They didn't care. It got a little better. She could make out Howie bending down to fix the dog's muzzle, but it was all dancing crazily, and people were laughing. And then, then the miracle. It was on Howie's smile that the picture steadied. That smile back over his shoulder after he had turned to go, and as if to bring to rights what had been wrong. The smile was held, and it was as if Howie lingered, as if in leaving the life he looked back over his shoulder and waited waited for his smile to reach Laura. Out of the jumble and blur, out of the wrong and meaningless, Howie's beautiful, steady smile, making it all right. She could not have told how it happened. As Howie passed, she turned to the little girl beside her whose head was without support, and, not waking her, supported the child's head against her own arm. And after she had done this, it was after she had done it, that she began to know as if doing it let down bars. 
Now she was knowing. She had wanted to push people aside and reach into the shadows for howling. She began to see that it was not so she would reach him. It was in being as he had been, kind, caring, that she could have a sense of him being near. Here was her chance. Among the people she had thought stood between her and her chance. How he had always cared for these people. On his way through the world with them, he had always stopped to do, to do the kind thing. As he stopped to make it right for the badly muzzled dog. Then there was something for her to do in this world. She could do the kind of things Howie would be doing if he were there. It would somehow keep him. It would fulfill him. Yes, fulfill him. Howie had made her more alive, warmer and kinder. If she became as she had been before, Howie would have failed. She moved so that the little girl who rested against her could rest the better. And as she did this, it was as if Howie had smiled. The one thing the picture had never given her, the sense that it was hers to keep, that stole through her now as the things come which we never know we can lose. For the first moment since she lost him, she had him. And all the people in that theater, and all the people in the world, here was the truth. It cleared and righted as how he smiled had righted in the picture. In so far as she could come close to others, she could come closer to him. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Hopefully, you enjoyed it. Uh, next week will be, or not next week, two weeks from now, uh, we'll be doing some stories that are a little bit less sad, I think. Um, we'll be doing A Tree, A Rock, Cloud by Carson McCullers and The Catbird Seat by James Thurber. That will happen on the first Thursday of the month, which will be the fourth. We hope you'll join us then. Have a great day.